so as far as the definitions are concerned so we are still embarking on we are trying to combine what we have learned 20 years ago and what we are seeing today and that is where the whole controversy is so an acute central serous courier retinopathy is probably a patient a treatment name patient who comes to us with a recent history of of a de- defective vision and who is diagnosed as cscr the age old definition of uh, an acute disease is up to 3 to 4 months so up to 3 to 4 months it is labeled as an acute disease now there are a lot of questions that are being asked today is it really necessary for us to wait for 3 to 4 months in a patient of a cscr before we initiate any form of treatment under the logic that it's a self limiting disease when we have treatments available which can curtail the Uh, duration of the disease and there is any if enough evidence based on uh, oct and other multimodal imaging and multifocal erg that delay in treatment does have some permanent cellular damage so the, in spite of that probably we can say any patient treatment name coming for the first time with a recent history can be diagnosed as an acute central serous courier retinopathy what is non resolving so non resolving is any patient who after 3 to 4 months still has some fluid so the disease is not really resolving so to be call it non resolving there is a lot of again overlapping between non resolving and recurrent disease if you have a patient who is coming to you uh, say for the first time to your clinic and you ask him have you had this disease earlier he may say yes i had it about 8 months back so when you have a history like that that the disease has been there 8 months back the question arises whether the disease at the uh, which is 8 months old has completely gone and it has come again or whether the initial disease had resolved 80 to 90 percent and it has again had an exacerbation so recurrent disease again is a very recurrent diseases sometimes are actually chronic diseases they need not necessarily be recurrent disease and chronic disease is any patient with long standing disease is a chronic disease he may come with a recurrent disease over a period of many years or a single attack which persists for a long period of time so what i want to emphasize is that the importance of multimodal imaging and in that probably the single most important investigation as far as a no csr patient is concerned is an good st oct and when you do an st oct it's very important for you to take multiple cuts and see all over the area of the serous macular detachment why is this important because the, the, it tells you whether it's an acute disease whether it's a chronic disease whether it's a csr masquerade so all these things can be answered actually to a large extent by doing a careful spectral domain oct now i have put up four pictures so if you pardon uh, 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 sir uh, uh, can you make it full screen it is not seen in the uh, this thing full oh, screen oh. i have put it as full screen yeah. i think i'll have to remove all these pictures here then i think uh, this how do i remove that no the i see rajiv sukumar and all of them in the corner so if i remove them probably i can no we can see only the desktop sort of thing uh, in the left side uh, it is written oh, oh. okay okay uh. okay i'm sorry one minute one minute i put it as slide show you in your uh, uh, powerpoint it is seen as uh, uh, full, full screen full screen huh? then yeah. here it is not a uh, one minute one minute Uh. No. No. Okay, one minute, one minute. Oh, okay, okay. No. Uh. Yeah, share. And when it's it's it's. Uh. Uh. क्लिक दैट ओपन दैट नाउ 
Uh, you have clicked, da? Huh? Yeah, now it is full screen here. Yeah. But here, here it is not coming. Oh, oh. Uh, one minute. I will. Can you go to close this and from the desktop we can uh, open that presentation? It is in desktop AOS 2020. That one minute, one minute, one minute. Share the screen. Close this. Yeah, yeah, one minute. Please close the screen, sir. That uh, close. The... Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 So I'm going back to the, uh, I mean the the OCT features. So if you look at these four pictures, now this is a case of an acute central serous courier retinopathy because you can see a serous macular detachment and it's completely empty here. It's totally hyperreflective. But when you see this picture and this picture, you can see a lot of hyperreflective dots within the serous macular detachment. These are all indications of a little chronic disease. This could be macrophages, it could be fibrin, it could be photoreceptor cells, and when you see the overhanging photoreceptor cells, this also tells us that the disease has been there for at least three to four months. And then when you see the cystoid change, these are all signs of chronic disease. Therefore, looking at the OCT, actually you can, to a large extent, tell as to how long the disease has been there. Why is this important? Very often in CSCR, the history is not reliable. Patient may give you a history of two weeks. But then the disease might have been there for a much longer time, and when you do a careful HDOCT, you can really look into these sort of pictures and then decide whether it's a very recent disease. This is a picture that I got from one of the review articles, and this is a very interesting picture. You can see here this same one patient over a period of four to five months. There is a resolution of the disease, but you can just see this hyperreflective area on the roof of the serous macular detachment. Which is progressively increasing as the disease progresses, and this again is just to show you how you can diagnose the chronicity of the duration of the disease by looking at an OCT. Okay, so basically OCT is a very important investigation. Pigment epithelial detachments are seen in about 50 to 100 percent of patients with central serous Fourier retinopathy. In good old days, we were taught that a small serous PD is often seen in a CSCR. But then today we know that we can even get large PEDs like this. What we are seeing here in patients with central serous courier retinopathy, and again in chronic uh, central serous courier retinopathy, you will see that the pigment epithelium becomes a little atrophic, as you can see here. Therefore, presence of a large serous PED does not necessarily mean it is not CSCR, and we do see patients with a large serous PED in CSCR. Another important finding in a PED is a micro rip. The area of the micro rip is the area of the RP leak. So, if you do a very careful SD OCT through the pigment epithelial detachment, sometimes you can see the small rip in the roof of the pigment epithelial detachment, and this is the area of the leak. So, why is this very important? There are certain situations where you may not be able to do a fluorescein angiography, and you have a patient with a recently long duration CSCR. And if you are able to see the rip, you don't need to do a FFA in those cases. You can treat with laser, just looking at the position of the rip, and this itself is can lead to complete resolution of the SMD. And we have had a large number of cases, and we have published this also in one of the journals a couple of years ago. Here also you can see another picture. Here you can see the RP rip, and as and this FFA you can see the leak corresponding to this particular area. This is the area where the pigment epithelial detachment and the rip is there. And when you do the FFA, you can see the leak here. So this is again a very diagnostic feature in the, in the central serous courier retinopathy, and it has already been reported in literature. We move from the so we looked at the serous macular detachment, we looked at the pigment epithelium. Now we are moving into the choroid. As you are all aware, choroid is taken in central serous courier retinopathy, what we call as a pachycoroid disease, and this is very very again important feature. Now it's also important to note that even in the fellow eyes which do not have the disease, there is a thickened choroid. This again has been reported in literature. 
And in patients with pachyco, I mean, in the central serous courier retinopathy, especially the peripapillary disease, this is a peripapillary chronic uh, disease, where you can see the enlarged pachy vessel, what we call as a pachy vessel. These are the outer choroidal vessels, which are very much dilated. And you can see here, they're compressing the inner choroid. These are very characteristic. And these pachy vessels are usually seen in the area of the disease only. The rest of the uh, OCT, you may have a slightly thickened choroid, but we may not see these pachy vessels. This again is very diagnostic in central serous courier retinopathy. Why is fundus autofluorescence very important? Fundus autofluorescence is important because it tells us about the chronicity of the disease, the amount of uh, cellular damage that has happened. So this again is very important, especially when you want to do the treatment. You can see here this is a patient with an acute disease. And these are patients who are having a resolved disease, a chronic disease resolved. And once you have that, that sort of a situation, you see these areas of increased autofluorescence. Whereas in a classic acute case, actually there's a slight decrease in the autofluorescence because of the presence of the fluid, which is actually acting as an impediment for the normal fluorescence from, the, uh, from behind. So that is a very important feature. Another important feature is the presence of RP tracts, like you can see here. So sometimes a patient, you may get a patient with a recent history of CSCR, but then when you do the OCT, you see some tract. It may not be this prominent, but the presence of an RP tract is only because of the gravitation of the fluid. And this again is an indication of the chronicity of the disease. Therefore, when you get a patient with a recent history of central serous courier retinopathy, and you have got some facility for retinal imaging, Probably the two important tests that you can do is an OCT and then an fundus autofluorescence. These are the two important tests that you need to do in any patient who's coming with a recent CSCR. Because autofluorescence tells you about the, uh, the duration of the disease, is there been a, is, has there been a previous attack of the disease, etc. And OCT tells you about the degree of the activity of the disease. And OCT is very helpful also in the follow-up of these patients when they come. So what do you tell the patient when a patient comes to you with a recent history of the disease? You tell the patient that you convince the patient, suppose only two weeks, ask him to come after one month. Don't ask him to come after two to three months. Ask him to come after one month, repeat the OCT, and the OCT will tell you whether it's getting better or worse. Indocine in green angiography is nowadays used in certain specific situations. Now on ICG, what we see is a focal area of uh, hyperfluorescence, especially in the mid phase of the ICG angiogram. Or the same focal area may be seen in multiple areas. You understand, you get some dilated choroidal vessels and this focal area. And when you do the OCT through these areas, you can see this irregularity of the retinal pigment epithelium, which we normally see in chronic disease and this hyperreflective material within the serous macular detachment. So ICG is really not really necessary for the diagnosis of CHCR. ICG is not really necessary for the routine management of central serous courier retinopathy, but ICG becomes necessary in certain patients with chronic CSCR, and ICG require, it becomes necessary sometimes in patients, slightly elderly patients, who are presenting to your clinic with a serous macular detachment because we are looking at CSCR mask rates, which I'll come to later. So fundus fluorescein angiography has got a lot of features. We are all aware of it. I don't want to unnecessarily waste my time. But I would like to only say that whenever we, when we, when we, when do we enter, do a fluorescein angiography, we do it only when we are going to planning some intervention in a patient with a CSCR. It's not routinely in, in indicated for a routine outpatient uh, checkup. But then once we have decided on some form of a treatment, like laser photocoagulation, PDT, etc., it becomes necessary. How do I manage my patients with central serous uh, chorioretinopathy? Actually, in all patients, we have to look for risk factors, especially if it is a chronic disease, it becomes even more important. By risk factors, we mean patient anxiety, you know, these sort of uh, lifestyle uh, uh, problems that the patient may have, and also whether he is consuming any steroid drugs, especially steroid skin ointment, any form of steroid inhaler. These are the two common things that we see in the inhaler for some asthmatics and also skin disease using some steroid ointment. So in any patient who's having a recently long-standing disease, fluorescein angiography is indicated. And as I told you, looking at the eye and looking at the OCT, the consultant can decide whether an endocene in green angiography also is necessary in that particular situation. So in a patient who's having a recently long disease, if it's an extra foveal leak, we do a focal laser. There are certain specific indications for low-fluence PDT, which I'll come to later. 
there are a lot of patients who come to you in your clinic who have persistent subretinal fluid, but when you do a fluorescein angiogram, you don't see a leak at all. In some of them, you can observe, you can try some oral medications, but again, these are probably indications for low fluence PDT. And in these sort of situations where the FFA is not showing a leak, and you have a facility for an intersigning green angiography, you can go ahead and do an ICGA, identify the areas where there are dilated choroidal vessels, and treat those areas with low fluence for a photodynamic therapy. So with this introduction, I'll just show you a few cases. These are the same cases that I recently spoke to in the recent All India meeting in Gurugram. So this is a simple case of a 46-year-old patient with a recent history of a, a defective vision. There are no risk factors at all. And if you look at the OCT, based on my definition, this is an acute CSCR, recent onset. And this patient had a spontaneous resolution over a period of one to two months, so that chapter is closed. So this is sometimes this is what we see in quite a large number of patients. This is my second case. He has got some systemic problems. Whenever we ha have patients with their chronic smoking, alcoholic, and all, I try to convince them to make a lifestyle modification. And in my experience over many years, I've seen that this definitely helps in preventing recurrent disease. This patient has got significant decrease in vision. If you see, this patient has got something like a yellowish uh, uh, discoloration here with a serous macular detachment. And even in the other eye, he has got these. These are things which we used to call earlier as RPE defects. But nowadays, many of these things are described as pachydrusin, which I'm not going to spend much time because it does not have much of clinical value. But nonetheless, in this particular patient, you can see the classic picture and in the area of the fibrin, you can see these hyperreflective areas. So this patient actually finally underwent, underwent fluorescein angiography. The reason why we did a fluorescein angiography, I did a fluorescein angiography is because he's got a little fibrin related central serous courier retinopathy. These are cases which affect the vision significantly. And when you do the FFA, you see multiple leaks, and this patient was treated with focal laser photocoagulation. So the reason for intervention in this case is slightly severe case, fibrin presence of fibrin, suggestive of a decreased vision, and also progression. So these are all indications for a little early intervention. So you can see over a period of time, you can see this particular picture here, there is complete resolution and also the PED has become much smaller and one PED has more or less collapsed. So this is another case just to show you how we manage a patient who is having a little bit of a persistent disease for some period of time. This is my third patient. This is probably one of my patients or one of the patients in our institute with the longest follow-up, nearly very long, nearly 10 years uh, follow-up. This uh, lady actually, she came to me many, many years ago and she came with defective vision, but character vision was normal. So character vision can be normal with hypermetropic glasses. This is very, very important for you to check the refraction. Therefore, there may be a, a significant hypermetropic power with which the patient may be normally, but that does not necessarily mean that the patient is not symptomatic. Now, if you look at the uh, a, a color photo, it looks more like a recent disease. It doesn't look like a chronic disease because we do not see much of RPE changes. Autofluorescence also, if you see, doesn't look a very long-standing disease. We don't see areas of patches of decreased autofluorescence, which we see in patients with recurrent disease. Now, when we do the OCT in both the eyes, she has got disease in both the eyes, bilateral disease she is having. So once a patient comes with bilateral disease and patient is not very sure about the duration of the disease, it is better to do the full investigation and do everything completely. So this patient actually, you can see here, see this patient had a <coughs> came back to us after a gap of about, actually initially she was treated with focal laser photocoagulation and in one eye. I didn't treat both the eyes because in one eye she had a subfoveal leak. I don't know where that angiogram is missing here. But nonetheless, she had a sub foveal leak, but in the other eye, she had an extra foveal leak. So one eye was treated and this patient improved a little bit, but was lost for follow-up about two to three years. And after that, she came back with both eyes showing significant decrease in vision. And based on my definition, you can see here in both eyes, she has got bilateral chronic central serous retinopathy. At this moment, again, she underwent a fundus fluorescein angiography. 
and you can see multiple uh, uh, checkings that has been done over a period of one and a half years. And during this one and a half years, she had focal laser two to three times in both, in, in alternating between one eye and the other. But still, she was coming back with recurrent disease. Therefore, this is just to show you that some of these patients have got a recurrent disease. Personally, I feel there is no harm in giving mild laser, especially the area if you are treating is little far away from the fovea. At this point of time, when the patient came with a recurrent disease, I finally did an ICG angiogram. The reason why I did an ICG angiogram is two reasons. One is I was planning to change the treatment to a photodynamic therapy considering the recurrent disease. And secondly, is considering the age of the patient, which is above 45, 48, 49, nearing 50 years, I did not want to miss some of the masquerades like pachycoral neovasculopathy and also <laughs> pachycoroid uh, uh, polypoidal disease. So I did a angiography, but angiography did not show any abnormal network. This was done way back in 2014 when we did not have facilities for octa. So you can see here there are some patches of choroidal hyperfluorescence here and there, but otherwise the ICD angiogram does not show much of a change. So at this point, after multiple treatments and after a treatment, after about four years of recurrent disease, the patient was finally convinced for photodynamic therapy. Half fluence PDT was done in both the eyes, in both the eyes. And after PDT, you can see here there is complete resolution of the subretinal fluid. There are a few hyperreflective dots here, which will also slowly disappear over a period of time. This is the other eye. You can see here the other eye also has shown complete recurrence. Now, this patient, I have a follow-up of five years after the PDT treatment. She has not yet come back even with a single recurrence. This is the one and a half year follow-up picture just to show you the resolved disease in both the eyes. Just to tell you that one of the biggest advantages of photodynamic therapy is that the patient has got resolution of the disease and also the incidence of recurrence. You can see here there is complete resolution and therefore the incidence of recurrence after the treatment is very, very low. We are having a large number of series in our center. Both me, Mahesh and my colleagues have been treating for the last many years and we, have, we are now working on our data to see what is the incidence of recurrence after PDT in chronic central serous periodotopy. But the, and this is one good case just to show you how in long term they follow up there is no recurrence. Therefore, the question therefore arises, what is the role of low fluence or half fluence PDT in CSCR? There are specific indications as far as in our practice is concerned. We do it for patients with chronic CSCR, by definition, long-standing disease, four to six months, or recurrent disease, as I showed you now, where the patient keeps coming back in spite of focal laser photocoagulation, or if you are giving oral mineral corticoid antagonists, and patients with CSCR with subfovia leak, these are patients where we cannot do the normal thermal laser. There are doctors who are trying the micropulse laser, which will come to, or the subthreshold laser, which I'll come to later. Therefore, these are the specific indications in our, in our clinic. So this is another case of a chronic central serous retinopathy. The right eye is very bad. The left eye is reasonably good. You can see, we see a lot of these sort of cases, what we call as a diffuse retinal pigment epitheliopathy, a good old definition of uh, chronic CSCR. You can see here there is significant RP fallout in the right eye. In the left eye, he has got a serous macular detachment. If you see the right eye, he has got a chronic cystoid edema. Now, this should not be confused with any other disease. This is the end-stage disease of central serous retinopathy. The right eye, there is nothing much that can be done to improve vision. But in the left eye, you can see here he has got minimal subretinal fluid. This is what I was telling you earlier. We see a lot of these sort of patients where, you know, there is persistent small area of subretinal fluid that does not get absorbed and there is a periodic exacerbation. You can see the choroid is quite thick. The RP is little irregular, suggestive of the chronic disease, and probably the poor RP function is responsible for this small amount of fluid not getting absorbed. So this patient, actually, if you do the autofluorescence, the right eye is practically gone, but the left eye also, you can see here, there is significant RP damage. You can see the area of decreased autofluorescence, and this is the biggest advantage of doing an FFA. FFA. Therefore, in spite of the patient having a vision of nearly 6 by 9, you can see the autofluorescence tells you that look here, he has got a chronic disease. 
So he went and underwent an ICGA also. And the reason why we did an ICGA is because the fluorescein angiography does not show any leak. You can see the left eye, the better eye. The fluorescein angiography does not show any leak, but there is persistent subretinal fluid in this particular patient. So actually, after many years, you can see here, this patient has been coming to me for many years. Very nice patient, very regular, waxing and waning, waxing and waning. You can see here, at times there is no fluid, at times there is minimal fluid. Waxing and paining, this is a very, very unfortunate situation as far as the patient is concerned. The reason why I did not suggest to him PDT is because of the chronicity of the disease and the RPE fallout. In patients with RPE fallout and RPE atrophy, we are a little careful in considering PDT because it can do harm, especially in a one-eyed patient with who is having very good visual acuity. So this is a big situation where finally in the absence of any leak, I finally started this patient on a Aptus uh, about a year ago and with Aptus there was a slight improvement. He is still continuing Aptus. He does not have any side effects. He is due for uh, follow-up. So this is just to show you some of these patients with the waxing and waning. I, I, in my practice, I don't use much of mineral corticoid antagonists. There are some consultants in my hospital who are using quite a lot of Aptus in patients with chronic CSCR. Because the, 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 in my experience, the, the results are a little unpredictable and, I'm, and these drugs have got some potential side effects on long-term use and it becomes very necessary that these patients have to come for very regular follow-up and we cannot suggest in patients who are not in a position to come. In Kerala, we have many youngsters who are coming from the Middle East and other countries and these patients do not come for follow-up. In such situations, it is very difficult to suggest Aptus. This is my last case, the fifth case. This is a very classic case of what we call the peripapillary disease. You can see here the cystoid changes in the peripapillary region between the fovea and the optic disc. This is known as peripapillary pachycoroid disease. This is another form of a central serous chorioretinopathy. This unfortunately does not have very good prognosis. And you can see these pachy vessels just underlying the area of the peripapillary disease. This patient actually one eye very bad. In the other eye, he has got the serous macular detachment. You can see the autofluorescence showing you the chronicity of the disease. The vision is very good because this area is bad, but you can see the large areas of RP atrophy. And you can see there is a one small leak here for which focal laser photocoagulation was done in the left eye. Therefore, when you see these sort of patients, especially peripapillary disease, we have to explain to the patient that this is a little chronic disease and they need to come for regular follow-up and probably in some of these cases we can try PDT in case there is a recurrence. So that is also another indication. Therefore, this is the last case where the right eye has got end-stage disease, the left eye has got focal laser uh, to the leak. Therefore, I showed you a wide variety of cases. A simple CSCR, a fibrinous uh, a CSCR. I showed you also certain chronic cases, bilateral chronic disease, which we see normally in the age group of about 45, 48, 50, 50 plus. And these are all situ different clinical situations, especially the last two, two cases are ones which already have got chronic disease and need more active treatment. And some of them probably may benefit with photodynamic therapy. Recently, the place trial report compared half dose PDT with micropulse laser, subthreshold micropulse laser. These are patients who had a minimum eight week history of central serous chorioretinopathy. They were all treatment nave patients. And in the comparative trial, they showed that PDT was far superior to micropulse laser, both in the, in the especially in the resolution of the serous macular detachment. You can see here 51.2% compared to 13.8% at the first checkup. That is about eight weeks after the uh, treatment was done. So there is a significant, and even at the completion, it is 67 versus 28, which is very significant. Therefore, the role of micropulse laser in, uh, in CSCR is still debatable. The only advantage is it's not very expensive, but then the availability of micropulse laser is also very less. Very few centers have micropulse laser. CSCR masquerades is very important. In one slide, I will just explain everything to you. Now, you look at four pictures here, four pictures of four patients. Now, can you tell me which are the ones that are central serous chorioretinopathy and which are not central serous chorioretinopathy? Now, is this CSCR? Probably everything is muted. Now, this is a case of CSCR. You see serous macular detachment. 
and this is what is known as a double layered sign where you find the elevation of the retinal pigment epithelium and the small gap between the retinal pigment epithelium and the Brooks membrane this is something like and what we call as an elongated PED and in, this is very small in size and the inside of this area is hyporeflective. So this is a classic case of central serous chorioretinopathy with an elongated PED or a DLS where there is a clear hyporeflective space. In this particular case, again you are seeing serous macular detachment, again you are seeing the same elevation of the retinal pigment epithelium and a gap. But then the space between the retinal pigment epithelium and the Brooks membrane shows uniform hyperreflectivity. So this is a case of a pachycoroid neovasculopathy. Therefore, this is a neovascular disease. Therefore, the thick fibrinous and leakage from these abnormal vessels causes this thick hyperreflectivity uh, uh, in, the, in the OCT. So this is a very beautiful picture to show you the difference between these two kind of, uh, OCT. So with OCT itself, you can diagnose. You don't need sophisticated equipment. Now, nowadays, as I told you, we get large PEDs in CSCR. This is a case of CSCR. It's got a huge PED, but this is a case of a, a, a central serous courier retinopathy because this is a clear, clear uh, space here. There's nothing here. It's a serous PED, serous macular detachment. Whereas here you see PED is small. But on the roof of the PED, you can see this hyperreflective material suggestive of a fibrovascular complex. This is a case of a polypoidal choroidal vasculopathy in the subfoveal area with serous macular detachment. So looking at the OCT carefully, you can differentiate all these masquerades. Therefore, once upon a time, probably we would have diagnosed all these four cases as central serous retinopathy. But today, as retina specialists, we know they are all four in different conditions. On your left, we have the CSCR. On your right, you have the masquerades, the common masquerades that we see. So this is a paper. We have published a couple of papers on all these things. This is an interesting paper that we published on the double layer side within the Indian Journal of Ophthalmology. Probably if you have the time, you can go through it. It will improve your knowledge. This is another particular case just to show you, again, a similar masquerade. Why it is very important for us to do the OCT carefully. Now, if you do the OCT carefully, you see this small irregular area here. You see it all around, from right from top to bottom. You can see this slight elevation. And as an experienced retina specialist or a medical retina specialist, you know that there is a neovascular membrane here. These are things which we probably we were missing a couple of years ago. But nowadays, we do not, we look at the OCT very carefully. And we know, again, you can see this neovascular network here, corresponding to that irregular elevation of the pigment epithelium. Today, if you have a facility for Octa, with Octa, you can diagnose these sort of membranes. You don't need an ICG angiography. Therefore, not all serous macular detachments are central serous courier retinopathy. And especially if you have a patient coming to you, a little elderly patient, about the age of 50 years, and also patients who are coming to you with recurrent disease or persistent disease, you must carefully look into these sort of features to find out whether you're missing something and whether it is a CSR mascara. So this is another case to show you a CSI, a serous macular detachment. This patient actually had persistent disease and we did an ICG angiogram. It showed some small focal area of hyperfluorescence here. The uh, angiogram, as usual, does not show anything except for RP defects. The octa, I don't know whether this is an artifact, but something like a neovascular, I mean, a suspicious neovascular membrane. And this patient underwent a PDT, and after PDT, you can see here there is complete resolution. About this particular situation, therefore, what is the indication? There was a talk recently, I was told, in the Madras City of Talmic Association, again, another Zoom talk. What is the indication of anti-VEGF in CSCR? There is no indication of anti-VEGF in classic central serous courier retinopathy, but it is only in these sort of situations where we have a CSR-like picture with a neovascular network. There is a role for anti-VEGF treatment, and this has to be first diagnosed before we uh, indulge in that. This is another interesting article. Actually, this was done by Jai Chaplani about one and a half, two years ago. Management of CSCR, some expert panel, in which gives you good insight as to when OCTA is indicated. Therefore, the question arises as to when should you do OCTA in your practice, if you have OCTA in your clinic. When will you do OCTA in patients with CSCR? In any patient with persistent CSCR, chronic CSCR, especially elderly patients with central serous courier retinopathy, it would be advisable. And especially when you have a flat, irregular PED like what I showed you, 
this is a very very important indication for doing an octa even in the absence of even in the absence of any serous macular detachment because there may be a silent neovascular network therefore this is one of the important indications for octa in your practice another important <coughs> uh and the masquerade is this particular case this is a patient you can see here you can see the gap here you can see the retinal pigment epithelial here and you can see the other eye also like that now these are patients who are sometimes misdiagnosed as central serous core retinopathy but they are actually classic best macular dystrophy you can see this beautifully in autofluorescence bilateral symmetrical and this hyper autofluorescence thing because of the lipofuscin material therefore this also sometimes is confused as csr in many centers across the world so i have given you a more or less a brief on uh, imaging on diagnosis on management etc as far as csr is concerned and you will agree with me that multimodal imaging has really improved our understanding of the disease and uh, actually probably we can have a 3 uh, to 4 hour session on a half day symposium on csr that's the sort of material that's available today history is very very important as i told you especially to find out the duration of the disease coexisting lifestyle features factors which are responsible for the disease which has to be altered use of certain drugs which can precipitate central serous retinopathy and it is very important for us to spend some time with the patient because these are very anxious patients anxiety will worsen the disease we need to spend some time and advice on lifestyle modification i always feel these are patients who need close follow up actually we have treated many doctors with this disease and they all say you know how symptomatic the disease is it's very easy when we see 6966 vision we think there is not much of a problem but that central scotoma is a very disturbing disease therefore we must keep these patients under oct and oct should be used uh, whenever they come for a follow up because that tells us about the condition of the eye the the intensity of the disease and whether it's really responding to your treatment and finally chronic disease and elderly patients should be approached differently as i told you the indications for in icd angiography octa and probably treatments like photodynamic therapy thank you all for your kind attention uh one person has asked uh, to elaborate on uh, uh, focal laser settings and all okay focal laser usually we give i mean i usually give a 50 micron spot size and i titrate and just give one you must localize the area of the leak very accurately now how do you localize with the retinal vessel and you just give one or two burns that is enough and tight start with about 50 or 60 milliwatt power and just give a mild treatment that is my way i how i treat now if it is very close to the fovea i usually i feel you should be very careful and uh, usually we don't treat uh, leaks which are within the foveal avascular so anybody uh, wants to ask any questions uh, you can either raise your hand or uh, unmute and good morning sir good morning sir yeah yeah uh, sir i want to ask uh, if the patient of acute csr is came so ah. when to go